There are seven of us here live at the Moody, Moody Theater, so thank you for that. Good morning and welcome to Mega Camp 2020. Um, we're excited about this. We respect your time. We appreciate the opportunity to spend the, this time with you. Um, I want to thank all, everyone who's put all this together. It, um, it took a lot of work to get us from doing something live to going to live streaming. So we're excited and let's begin the day. Good morning, guys. Good morning, guys. This is virtual high five, Nick. There we go. <laughs> you know, Jay, um, uh, we have a, a, a pretty remarkable day planned. It's, it's going to be a long day, uh, but I think it'll go fast. So we, um, the way we kind of thought this through was um, we have the opportunity to um, do things a little differently. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to experience Mega Camp in a slightly different way. And I'm excited to see how that turns out. Oh, man, the hours we put in and we've got just the best for today. Yeah, yeah. You know, these are unprecedented times. Uh, pandemic, civil unrest, recession, national di disasters. Unbelievable. It's been an unprecedented year. I don't think anybody could have ever predicted all of these things would happen at once. I know, I know, I know, I know. You know, when I reflect back... Um, uh, because I've had time to reflect, right, uh, in, 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 in this era of social distancing. Uh, I have found some time to, uh, in quiet moments that I didn't plan on having to kind of think about my life a little bit. And one of the things I was reminded of is that um, uh, who I am is kind of simple. When I strip away uh, my, my roles, my titles, my actions, my results, and I just think about, about me, I realize I'm reduced down to just a, a couple of words, right? Love, compassion, caring, giving. And it kind of has, has given me the opportunity to, to take this kind of renewed understanding of, of who I am and uh, drive it back through my roles, my titles, my actions, and my results. The other thing that, that has kind of struck me is that uh, self-image is a choice. It's kind of a gift we give ourselves. Um, if, if, if you have a poor self-image uh, or a low self-image, you have uh, low self-esteem, you have uh, low vision for your life, you take low actions, you have low results. 
if you have a, a bigger vision of who you are, a, a better self-image, a higher self-image, that translates into a bigger life, right? From going from ordinary to extraordinary. The other thing I realize is that happiness is a habit. And that is, again, it's a gift you give yourself. Happiness uh, doesn't just automatically happen. Some people are, I guess, born happy. But the reality is, is that no matter what our circumstances is, one of the biggest challenges in life is, is accepting the opportunity to be okay. Even in a moment of great disaster, of great tragedy, it's still okay to feel okay. And it's a gift you give yourself and it's a habit that you build. Um, Self-confidence is learned. And that's a big one. You know, the, we talk about this in Quantum Leap, that um, you, you set out to master something. And the reason you set out to master it, in the end, is to accomplish what you set out. But the other one is to, is to build self-confidence. To, because self-confidence, once you learn that you can set out to do something and then turn around and uh, actually master it at some level, it teaches you that you can, you can do it again and you can do it again. And it becomes this virtuous cycle of taking on challenges and having the confidence that y you can take it on and that you can actually deliver at a higher level, right? And the last one is that relationships are simple. Uh, when you think about relationships, uh, the way that, that um, the world spells um, love is T-I-M-E. And in, in all that we're going through right now, we've been given, uh, whether you call it a gift or not, we've been given time. And it's allowed us to, in many ways, kind of reflect on what matters to us about relationship and get back in touch with that. So it's been, a, uh, it's been an interesting time for me uh, of reflection and actual uh, kind of reconnecting to the fundamentals of who I am and how I drive that through my life. You know, for the, the 20 years I've had the privilege of working with you, you've talked about the inner game and the outer game. Yeah and how everything on the outside comes from the inside. And That's so right. um, we've all had a different way to look at our time these last few months, right? We've had to reallocate our time. A lot of the distractions have gone away. We've gotten hyper-focused on what's clearly mattering. That's right. And I think we can now, what I'm hearing you is, if we get clear about who we are and who we want to become, we can express that through what we do. That's it. And we can have That's a bigger well impact, especially right now when people, our clients, need us more than ever. Yeah, I think that's right, 100%. Well, the, um, when we, we probably should stop right now and simply just mention that, um, you know, the, the Gulf Shores are going to hit again. That, that, uh, the fires in the Northwest. I mean, it just keeps coming. It doesn't stop. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we just wanted to say that, you know, Keller Williams, uh, as an organization, as a community, and as a culture, we have a long history of uh, caring for others and extending ourselves. And right now, you know, KW Cares is there. It is certainly um, on the ground making its impact, but it also has um, uh, legal constraints about what it can do. So the two things that all of us can do right now is give where we can give. If we, if we can give money to KW Cares, do that. KW Cares will absolutely get that money in the right hands. And like you and I were talking about, 100% of your donation to KW Cares goes straight to uh, the families and the individuals and the businesses that need it. The other thing you can do is gift cards. We've learned over the long haul of doing this that um, giving people a gift card and allowing them to purchase what they need in the moment is probably the most powerful thing you can do. And you have the addresses of the regions for the Northwest and for Gulf states. And if you can get uh, gift cards to them, uh, they will make sure that the, the men and women and the businesses in their regions um, get what, what they can distribute to them. Yeah, we saw this earlier this year when we had um, Lake Charles disaster, right? The same thing, we provided relief where we could. Um, the 501C3, the organization KW Cares was able to give a lot of grants very quickly and we fill the gaps with these gift cards. So let's keep it up. This is about our culture. This is what we do. When bad things happen, we respond. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, well, let's turn to the heart of success, if you will. I've actually got my notes with me. You know, you and I, thought, we, we talked about um, what the format would be for this morning. And after a while, uh, first we said, 
Um, give us our chairs from our office. <laughs> so these are actually right out of the, the, the chairs that you and, I, the writing room. you and I sit, sit in um, most days. Um, and secondly, we said, let's just be casual, that there's no need. We could certainly come out with a, a, um, a, a highly planned out, uh, you know, power speech. Um, but the more I reflected on the times, I, I, I wanted to, to not go that route. I really kind of wanted to just be us sitting around and, and talking uh, to everyone the way that, that we just talk. Um, so can we do that? Let's do it. And our intent always with this is to give everyone perspective, right? When things like this happen, we can look at history and that's what we're about to do and get real perspective so that beyond last month and next month, we know how to behave so that we can better navigate these crises. Yeah, and, and in a few minutes as we get into this, um, this is not meant to scare people. No, um, but trying you, to inform. That's right, and, and, and again, bring perspective. And so let's dive into this. Um, so I don't think, I don't think that, that um, we need to spend a lot of time talking about this in particular, right? As we sit here today um, in the United States, we're at 6.5 million recorded, acknowledged uh, cases for COVID-19. Um, and, the, and death is... It's over 194,000 deaths just in the U.S. alone. Yeah. Um, it's, um, as you, we are noting, I mean, this is the backdrop for all of the economic, everything we're going to talk about is this, is what happened to us in, in March. But it's not the first time we've been in a pandemic. No, this is the third in the last 100 years. The, the first one was um, in 1918, Spanish flu. And yet about 500 to 700,000 deaths, Jay, they didn't know what they were dealing with. They, they didn't, they, they didn't understand the virus at all. Not at all. They did not. And uh, it, it was pretty devastating, right? Um, the, uh, the next one was 1957. Yeah, I wasn't really even aware of that. No one's talking about the fact that we had a flu pandemic in 1957 that also spurred a recession. Yeah, so it, it showed up in the summer of 57, right? Um, over the course of that pandemic, they had recorded between 70 to 120,000 deaths. Um, but they got a vaccine fast, didn't they? That's right. By October, they had a similar kind of shutdown, right? Yeah. Everything shut down. People didn't go to movies and, and to retail. Same kind of economic impact. But they had a vaccine by October of the same year. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, and it still, here's the interesting thing, though. It still took how long? Um, unemployment went from, I think it was... Um, Four and a half to seven and a half percent. Right. Right, right, and it did, and it, and it, but it took till the end of '59 for that seven and a half percent to come back down. And that's the interesting thing. They got was it 40 million doses of this vaccine out, or you know, it was yeah, a within, huge initiative. Yeah, within six to seven months of it happening, uh, because it was not a, a a an extremely rare strain. It was it was something that was well, we we have a rhythm for dealing with the flu, right? We and we know how to manufacture a vaccine. But the thing that shocked both of us is it still took another year and a half, right, for it all to unwind after the vaccine showed up. Yeah, so here's what's instructive. What, what, what the takeaway from, from, from this conversation is that even if a vaccine shows up, um, history says it's going to take a year or two years for that to wind its way through uh, the, the public and then to have any sort of, a, of an impact on the economy. That's right, and, and we're it, gonna talk, we're gonna end on a positive note about how we come out of this, uh, and that is one of the ways, but we wanna be really conservative in thinking that it's just gonna be all over the moment we have a vaccine. Yeah, that's right. So, um, all right, so this is interesting. So, so if you would look on the right and um, look at the Great Recession. So what we want you to, to understand is that uh, unemployment was around 5% in 2007. Now, just as a sidebar, uh, the national historical average in the United States, and today, we're, because of a limited time on this, we're just going to use the United States as kind of a placeholder for what, what can happen around the world. But in the United States, the, the national historical average is 5% unemployment. And, and I would just say to those, I mean, we have probably 52 countries watching right now. Yes. So hello, KW Worldwide and everyone in Canada and Mexico. Um, 
watch the numbers that we're tracking. If you can track unemployment, GDP, sales, interest rates, the same handful of stats, that's how you get really informed and understand everything that's happening. Yeah, that's exactly right. The, the, uh, as we've always said, um, every time we have a, t a chance to talk about this, just follow the numbers of unemployment and GDP and ultimately inflation. But, but those are the three numbers. As, in, as employment goes, uh, so goes consumption. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But unemployment or employment is the first big number to look at. So in December of, of seven, we were, we were doing really good. Uh, we'll look at uh, GDP in a, in, a, in a few minutes and you'll see we were, doing, we were doing pretty good. And all of a sudden, recession hits and we go in, in a short period, but about two years, it climbs all the way to 10%, okay? Now I'm gonna stop right there. And I'm going to look at the left graph and point out that it took two months to go from three and a half to 14.7. And in the history of recorded time, this has never happened that quickly before. Truly unprecedented. It's unprecedented. So if you go back over though, so understanding that you're in unprecedented times is, absolute, is an absolute. If you go back and look on the right again, the second thing that you notice, Jay, is how long it took to unwind that 10%. So if you look down at the bottom, you'll notice that from 09 to 12. So we're talking about a little over three years to get back to, to get to seven and a half percent. And it wasn't until 2016 that they got back to five. Right. It took seven years from the peak to get back to normal levels of unemployment. Um, and I mean, we knew that that was kind of a slow recovery, right? It wasn't a red hot recovery, but that's seven years. Yeah, and it's, it's not normal for you and I to try to make predictions per se, but if we were asked to make one, we would both agree that the, the most likely scenario is if this takes a while to unwind. Yeah. This is not a, a there's, no, there's not gonna be anything uh, as a fast, fast recovery. Mm -hmm. It'll take a while to unwind. Uh, notice that we ended up, though, rather rapidly back as the economies start uh, opening back up in certain areas, that it settled back in at 8.4. Now, okay. well, we both talked about this. We'll know by the end of the year, we'll start to be able to tell, like, how many of those people are going to stay unemployed. I mean, this is opening and shutting. People got furloughed. They got brought back. We're going to see how this unwinds in the next few months to know, like, what is the actual true unemployment level that we are setting this at right now? Well, and here's, the, here's probably the most important slide that we could show you today. Yeah. Uh, this, this, t this, we're going to spend a few minutes on this because um, we need to unpack this for you to, uh, to, to fully understand what's going on. So let's start on the right and look at leisure and hospitality. So this would be restaurants, hotels, uh, music venues, you know, just as a sidebar, we're in the historic Moody Theater, and this is the home of Austin City uh, Limits. Um, uh, there's no music going on. Uh, it looks a little different than I've nor normally seen it. Um, but uh, this, this venue is, is in there. It's been impacted as well. There are no live tapings of Austin City Limits going on right now uh, in, with crowds in, 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 the, in the audience. So that's what that is. And I want you to notice that the unemployment rate for this group is 21.3%. Now put that in, in a historical perspective for us. I mean, we haven't seen that level um, across the board since the Great Depression when almost a quarter of Americans were unemployed. So that's a massive number. Um, a massive and number. for that segment of the industry, it's really devastating. And we all know that. Yeah, that's exactly right. If you swing over to transportation and warehousing toward, uh, sort of in the middle, at 13%, um, this is, this is um, uh, by air, by water, by- it's Planes, trains, buses, moving people largely, right? Transportation, and then yeah. the warehouses that serve retail and everything else. That's exactly right. And they're at 13%, so, which again is, is astronomically high. So I want you to notice that, that what's happened so far has impacted the men and women who make the least amount of money on a weekly basis, on average, have been impacted the greatest. That, right? I'm not sure you said that. The blue bars is the average weekly income by industry, and the yeah. purple bar is their level of unemployment. Yeah, so thanks. you can see it's very unequally being met, meted out 
in terms of unemployment and opportunity. And if you take the, the, the four to the far right, so from transportation and warehousing, education and health services, retail trade, and leisure and hospitality, and you average that out, it's about 12.3%, Jay, which again is, is a, that's a major recession. For that group of individuals, that is a major, major, major recession. Now, if we go to the far left, this is where the story applies directly to the real estate industry. If you'll notice, the men and women that have the highest weekly earnings in the United States were impacted the least. They're below average in terms of unemployment. Well, 4.2%, an economist would tell you, is very close to being 100% employment. When, right, because some you, people are migrating between jobs. Right. That's right. 4.2% is just is, is an incredibly low number. If you take... Um, the, the, the five that are from financial activities all the way to manufacturing, that average is what? 6.3%. So the five um, highest paid industries are just a little bit above average in terms of their unemployment rate. Yeah, and if you take out financial activities and just take those four, that number is, is what? 6.8? 6 6 yep. Yeah, 6.8. So again, um, even though, just as a sidebar, Jay, even though 5% is the national historical average, anything at six or below is a, is a really good number. Yeah. You're, you're at six and your economy is, is okay. It's not great, it's not amazing, but it's okay. You're not in dire straits. So if we, if we literally look at from manufacturing all the way to financial activities, they're not they're not, as a group, overwhelmingly suffering. And these are the highest income earners in our economy. Well, I mean, the punchline, Gary, I mean, this is what we're trying to get at, is those people are the ones that are buying and selling homes, and we'll see how quickly they did it. This is how you have the sales that we've been having, That's right. how you have a, a spike in the stock market when you also have this high unemployment. It's just not hitting the same people the same way. Well, you mentioned the stock market, and, and we just want to remind you that the stock market is, is not the economy no. uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It's not. Uh, it's a completely separate animal unto itself. Um, but what I want to, I want to just dot the I that you just said, and that is, the reason why the real estate industry, one of the reasons that the real estate industry has, has so far not been incredibly, incredi incredibly affected is because the men and women that make the most amount of money are the least that are suffering financially at this point. That's right, at this point. Now, just to, we'll make this comment again, but please understand that if something doesn't occur to help the men and women that are on the far right, their lack of employment begins to affect the far left. It can be like dominoes. You know, the next spot we talked about, you know, you've got um, transportation and warehousing is being impacted by retail and leisure. Now manufacturing and wholesale might be impacted by those staying out and yeah. it starts to work its way from right to left. Well, that's right. The dominoes go this way, don't they? Yep. And they, they could end up falling all the way in a big way to the far left, uh, depending upon what happens. Right. The, the stimulus package that was given so quickly um, kept the people on the far right, for the most part, that group, it brought um, uh, a significant amount of support just enough in order to keep the, the, anything happening to the far left. We'll see that when we get to delinquencies. They were able to keep paying rent and a lot of things. That was the support they needed to get through that time. Yeah, so here becomes the, the, the second bookend to this picture, Jay. And let's start on the left on this. So this is unemployment and housing by age. So if you look on the far left, you'll notice that the 24 or younger group, who by the way only make up 3% of the home buying population in America, uh, are at 14.1%. Again, that's a, that's a horrible number. Yep. It's only 3% though of the buying public. So we're not feeling that unemployment in our industry very much at all. Not at, hardly at all. Uh, you get to the 25 to 34, which would usually normally be your first time home buying that's sector. Right. Uh, they make up 25%, which is typical of first time, the percent of first time exactly. home buyers in the market. It's very close to the, the, the national average on that. Um, they're at 9.7%. That's a significant number. Um, it's not overwhelming, but it's a significant number. 
However, if we get to the 35 and older crowd, which is uh, the group that makes up 72% of all home purchases in the United States, they're only at 6.8. Again, it kind of helps to understand how is the housing market still thriving? It's because the people who buy houses have not yet been really impacted by this. Yeah, the people that make the most amount of money and have the most disposable income and the men and women who make up the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of, of buying homes, uh, the 35 and up crowd, uh, are the least affected with unemployment. So their, their incomes have been affected the absolute least, Jay, mm -hmm. and, their and their employment has been impacted the absolute least of the, the major age groups. And that's why housing has, has seen a rebound at this point. And it was fast. Those people that were secure in their jobs, right, and at that right age range, they took, we'll see in the, in the yeah. housing sales, they took action pretty quickly. Yeah, they did. They did. Um, and, you know, I just want to make a sidebar comment, and that is uh, we're talking about this in clinical terms right now. These are people's lives. And whether it be 6.8% or 9.7 or 14, that means there are significant people in our society today that are, are in trouble and, yeah. and they're in pain. So I don't want, I don't want our clinical, analytical, uh, statistical conversation in any way uh, to demean or, or, or dismiss uh, the, the, the tragedy uh, that's occurring in real life that, that, we're, that we're actually talking about in somewhat clinical terms. Yeah, and again, our goal is just to inform you, like help you understand why the market is doing what it's doing and then later how we can respond to it. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, so let's, let's switch gears then. So we now have a clear understanding of income and employment and it really paints a very vivid picture for why the real estate industry in the United States uh, rebounded the way it did. Because people who had jobs and had money, so they, so they had the means to take action, looked up and said, I'm taking action. Yeah. Right? I'm either going to remodel my home or I'm going to switch houses. Yeah, you were sharing with me in Austin, Texas, if you have the means, you have a two year wait to get a swimming pool. Yeah. Right? That's how much demand has showed up in some sectors by the people who can afford it. Yeah, that's exactly right. You can't buy a kiddie pool. No. <laughs> um, so GDP would be the next number, Jay. And shoot. And this is about spending, right? 67% of GDP is driven by consumer spending. Yeah. So if people are unemployed, they're not spending. If they don't have a CARES Act to get them through, they're not spending. And that's what creates these massive drops. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, corporate buying, business buying. Uh, government, government spending, right? Exports. Yeah, that, that's the, that's the uh, minus imports. Yeah, that's the, those, that makes up the other. 33%. Uh, yeah, that's right. So when you look at this, <clears throat> again, uh, in the history of recorded time, the speed at which GDP dropped has, ha they've never seen this before. No, it's never. And that's an annualized number. If the activity had stayed that way for the year in Q2, it would have been a negative 31.7%. It's massive and unprecedented. And the Great Depression, the biggest drop we saw was 12.9%. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, we've never seen anything like this at the speed at which this happened. And we all felt it. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was an absolute sense of panic that occurred across the board, and rightfully so, right? Oh, yeah. yeah it, felt, it felt like the Right. Well, it, it galvanized all of us into action, right? Those of us who were ready, we were like, okay, this is serious and we have to, now we have to move. Yeah, that's right. So <clears throat> this, gives you, this gives, really gives you perspective. So just kind of take a look at this. <clears throat> um, if you start at the left and kind of work across, one of the things that you notice immediately is um, the numbers uh, four. And you'll notice that in the run-up to 2000, 2001, wow. The dot-com economy came online. Oh my the gosh. market was incredibly hot. We actually ended up with a bubble, which is why it dropped in 2001. Yeah, it dropped. And then, by the way, within three years, it had regained its momentum, and, and which, of course, led us to 05, right? And the, the, the Great Recession was on. But notice, as bad as the Great Recession was, and it was devastating, by the way, yep. GDP <clears throat> on an annualized basis never dropped below 2.8. 
you know, the, compared to the last slide, the worst quarterly drop we saw was when Lehman Brothers went down in the yeah. end of 2008, and it was about 8.5%. But you work out the whole year, it was negative less than 3%. Mm -hmm. And this year, we're expecting to end the year at negative 6 Which, um, again, you go, well, that's not as bad as 31. And you go, well, yeah, but let us put this in perspective. This is, 6 would be the fifth worst uh, GDP year in recorded history in the United States. Right, three of those were there in the Great Depression, and one, um, I have to look at my notes, that 1946, when the U.S. government stopped spending on World War II, oh, it wasn't yeah. even a recession. They just removed all that government spending and it dropped. So the definition of a recession is two quarters in a row, so six months in a row of a drop in GDP. So if you understand that, you'll then realize that the recession, they all said it, it happened in 08 and 09. But the reality is, is that it actually started back in 05. Oh yeah, we remember it. We were doing a mastermind with our top agents. It was the fall of 05. Yes. And one of our top agents said, our showings have dropped off. And that was the first indication that buyers were saying enough is enough. Yes, that's, that, that's, that's exactly right. So when you only see the, the two negatives don't uh, write in 08 and 09, please understand that, that that recession lasted from 05 all the way to 09. Mm -hmm. That's how long the recession actually lasted. And we all felt it, by the way. Well, it was very centered in the real estate market. <clears throat> yeah, and then it started climbing out starting in 2010. But it, it, one of the things that we also need to point out, and we've pointed this out for <clears throat> the last seven or eight years, and that is from 2010 all the way to 19, except for 18, that's very pedestrian. That's very average. 2% uh, um, uh, GDP growth is kind of the minimum target number Two and a half to three percent is what they really want to see. This means we're healthy. It doesn't mean that we're strong or good. Yeah, four percent is extremely robust. Yes. By the way, but anything between two and three is good, solid, but it isn't a boom. Which right. is why coming out of the Great Recession, we it didn't ever felt like a boom. It was just this gradual on top of it, on top, on top of on top of this building of just little better, a little better, a little better, and a little better. And that's one of the reasons it took seven years for employment to get back in line, right? Because yeah. it was just kind of a gradual recovery and people started getting their jobs back gradually. Yeah, and here's the other thing, is because you never saw it boom, you never saw construction come back fast. Right. So one of the, re we're gonna look at this in just a second, and that is <clears throat> the months of available inventory. Mm -hmm. But the reason why that never got back into any sort of a balance, <clears throat> excuse me, is because of that right there. Yep. And because of that, we bear, well, we'll talk about it in a second. But there, there it is. And, there, and this is most likely where we're gonna be. Um, the prediction of what would GDP look like uh, next year, nobody knows. Yeah, and we try to stay out of the crystal ball. Like we're trying to give you perspective to say, you know, maybe um, make hay while the sun shines for sure. Yeah. Save a little bit right now. Um, well, that's right. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. So let's start, let's then look at how this translated. So uh, at this point, the we're down from 2019, 4.7%. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that that build up to 2019, 2019 was an amazing year. Yeah. It was a year of all years, the best year recorded, right? So when you start comparing 2020 to the best year ever, uh, only being down less than 5%, is actually a big deal. Yeah. There's, there's so much room in that low of a drop that a lot of people are having their best year ever, right? Yeah, so let's, uh, let's unpack this real quick. So if you go to the far left, you'll notice that um, to, the yellow is 2019, the blue is 20. So you'll notice that January, February, and even March, we were headed towards having an amazing 2020. Yeah, and that number in March is kind of, you look at it dropped. Remember, for most of us, for half that month, we could not do anything but close the business we already had. Yeah, that's right. So we were shut down through a lot of that. And still recorded a better month than the year before. And then it hit. It hit in, in, in early to mid-March, and the wheels come off in April, they come off in May, they come off in June. But what was happening 
in May and June is even even uh, towards the end of April is contracts started being written. Well, People that, that had thanks, means. And that's thanks to you. Like everyone is watching this. You figured it out. Like how do we go virtual? How do we still serve our customers? You figured that out in late March and early April, and we're able then to work with them, yeah. all of those people who wanted to jump into the market. Yeah, the speed at which um, you and I were sitting there going, we're gonna, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna have to explain to everybody what they need to do. And when we started calling around, we figured that, oh my gosh, they already, they already figured it out. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah the, the, the real estate industry moved very fast to, to virtual, right? And this is what this is what this pandemic has done, Jay. It has collapsed the speed of disruption. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about virtual and digital and a digital world and how fast we would migrate to a digital world. And most likely what's happened is uh, what was gonna take another five, six years to organically get adoption has literally happened overnight. That's right. It accelerated now here. the trends that were already there. And it exposed. Anybody that was saying, oh, we have plenty of time to migrate to a digital platform or a, a digital way of doing business got caught. Um, Keller Williams was made fun of when I started talking about this about three years ago. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I have a message for that, but anyway. <laughs> so it, this, it, it happened and here we are, right? And what's interesting is that if you look at June and July and then you look at August and September, yeah, all, all good months. All, all actually, um, we're, climbing, we're climbing right out of it. Yep, and when we look at our pending data, we know that August and September, we're looking good. Yeah, what will happen? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, home prices. So if you notice again, what happens when there's limited supply and there's strong demand. And historic, historically low interest rates. Incredibly yeah. cheap money out there is driving prices up. Yeah, and we can, you know, there was a lot of noise at the beginning of the year, and rightfully so, that uh, interest rates would be raised, and they were. And we saw that. Because they, were, they're, they, they saw this unbridled demand and inflation, and they wanted to begin to grab a hold of that. And... Um, so that they were, the rates were coming up, and then this happens, and we're off and running. Yeah. I'm not sure when rates will go up. There's, most people are forecasting it'll be some time before they do. Yeah, I, I, it, there's, I, I'd quit talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, it. There's just no motivation. There's nothing driving it. Uh, and, the, and you and I were talking about this, man, and that is there's a good chance that our economy has gotten addicted to low interest rates, and even trying to raise them to any sort of significant levels to have a, a, a something that they can later lower if they need to, I, I don't know how that happens. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it, it itself could cause a recession. Just doing that, mm -hmm. right? And it most likely would. <laughs> um, so this is the big tail right here. And this is the, the month's supply of inventory. The yellow is 19, the purple is 20. Um, so if you go, if you go to um, uh, July and, you, and June and July and you look at those percentages, uh, right, 3.9 months, 3.1 months of supply, this is historic, right? Uh, just a sidebar, from 1999, just write this down, you guys, from 1999 to 2016, there were only four months that had four months or less of inventory. Jay. That's right. It was incredibly rare for that long period of time. Only four, only four months between 1999 and 2016. However, listen to this, from 2017 to today, 20 months. Out of 43. Out of 43. So almost half of, of the months between 17 and now, you had below four months of inventory. Yep. Cheapers. And what's funny is, I mean, we've been talking about this throughout the recovery from the Great Recession. We had all those builders go out of business, so we didn't have the new supply coming online. And now, I mean, we had a low inventory situation that has really been accentuated by this crisis. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And we don't see any let up. That's the challenge. And that, in, that inflates pricing, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of resale um, people out there that might be thinking about they want to move but don't feel secure. 
And I think when we talk about later how we get out of this, there are a lot of people that maybe pin up demand later for that, but right now we're not seeing it. People are not afraid to sell their most valuable asset if they don't have to and they don't have a plan for buying. Well, and this is, this is why you're beginning to see bridge loans discussed again, because the, the opportunity to go buy your, you know you're gonna sell your home. Mm -hmm. The question is, would there be anything to buy? Right. And so this is why you see all of a sudden that financial mechanism showing back up in conversations across the, the country. Um, and we just threw this slide up here just to give you guys a sense, look at this. The numbers are all over the map, right? Um, so this, this down less than 5% nationally, we just wanted to point out that, that that's not relevant to people in Miami or LA or Philadelphia or Boston. Well, it's like the average temper in temperature in America. It doesn't really matter if you're in Florida or Nome, Alaska. No, right? and the challenge is the federal government doesn't look at those numbers though. Mm -hmm. They look at that national average and they make their decisions based on the, the common experience, not the individual experience. What we can point out is that we, we can see sales are down either a little or a lot and inventory is down a lot across the board. And what's really curious is that price is up across the board. It just depends on how much in each of those categories. Yes, that's exactly right. Pay attention to your numbers. Look at your unemployment locally. Look at your economy locally. And it's going to tell you what these numbers are going to be, Jay. All right, so let's, let's, let's switch gears and let's talk about, as we end this section, um, uh, let's talk about what we think's coming up next. And when we ask our, our research team to help us out with this, they actually had said there were option one and two. Yeah, two scenarios. Yeah, and you and I read it and we looked at our, our amazing team and we said, guys, we don't think these are options. We think these are stages. Mm -hmm. um, and so let's just kind of walk through this. So um, I want to just point out what K-shape means. And K-shape means that that uh, there are two distinct groups having two distinct experiences. We saw that back with the unemployment by industry, right? There are some that are doing well and some that are really not. Yeah, so again, those who are in, indirectly impacted uh, are having a better time of it than those who are directly impacted by it. And they call that a K shape, and you can just see the K. So going back to this. So the, the number one in stage one, the owner-occupied market continues to see strong demand. And right. the, the reasons are, 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 are obvious. You have historically low interest rates. You have income for earners in income ranges, typically of homeowners uh, remaining stable, mm -hmm. right? And they're creating that, that demand on limited inventory. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Uh, and, and you have low inventory. Uh, number two, potential stumbling blocks are, uh, are potentially in the investment market, right? Renters begin to struggle. Uh, leading to missed rent due to high unemployment in service and retail industries. And I, that's a, this is, this is going to happen, by the way. It's already happening. You just have uh, the, the forbearance. And I mean, when we talk about the social climate right now, this actually creates a bigger gap between the haves and the haves nots. We have to acknowledge that. The people who can afford to take advantage of low interest rates are going to benefit even more over the next few years. So it doesn't serve us to stay in a K-shaped recovery for a long time. Yeah, that's exactly right. The, um, and by the way, all of this could push rents down. Yeah. Um, loss of cash flow could lead to more rental properties going up for sale and potential shift from income to owner-occupied property, yabba -dee, yabba -dee, yabba -dee. It's It's this series of dominoes. What happens when you have all this forbearance and then when ultimately that ends, and they don't have a job. Yeah, that's when the other shoe drops. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we look at delinquencies, but that is one of the big risks that we can look at and keep an eye at for 2021. So just imagine again, you guys, what would it, would it have looked like if the federal government hadn't stepped in and the CDC uh, stepped in and uh, created forbearance? Right. What would have happened? Well, we went through that in 2008, right? The last housing recession, we saw un unprecedented REOs and short sales. People were pushed out of their homes. Yeah, and people are asking us now, so what about foreclosure and short sales? And our response is, uh, not yet. Not yet. And, and there is time. The, the understand that the, the political climate that we're in in the United States 
is, is interesting and somewhat stressful. Um, they acted very quickly, by the way, right off the bat. And thank God they did. It was the right move and all, all parties should be congratulated. Even though not all the money got to the right places, Jay, enough of it got to the right places. Yeah. Now, here's an interesting point to make. And that is all the money that got to the wrong places ended up in the stock market or a savings account. Unprecedented savings, right? Unprecedented growth in savings, right? You never would have imagined that. And number two, the stock market going up. Yeah. Well, those I, people who got relief, a lot of them weren't able to go and spend that money, and they did save it, which is actually could be a long-term bright spot for us. Well, if they get their jobs back, they have savings, and they can do something. And everybody that got extra money that decided to go to the stock market put it in uh, Facebook, Amazon, <laughs> Google, yeah. Apple, right, and, and Tesla, and phew, off they go. Right, 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 right. Anything that looked like it was a digital platform-based business, like Zoom, literally zoomed to over, what, $100 billion in valuation? Well, again, we talked about the acceleration It of makes trends. no money. It makes no money, by the way. Oh, yeah. that's, a whole no money. Other, that's a whole other topic. But the acceleration of trends that were already in place happened really fast, right? Well, and people expected more of it. Well, you're going to see, just I'll make one more sidebar statement about the stock market, and that is you are going to see those businesses like Zoom and others that have high valuations and actually don't make uh, money. You're going to see them going on buying sprees, trying to buy EBITDA, trying to buy cash flow. Right. I mean, that's, that's the natural outcome of that kind of valuation for businesses that know the other shoe is going to fall. At some point, they're going to expect proof that it actually makes money. Right. Otherwise, you're going to have a failed IPO or whatever else. So they'll use that equity to buy cash flow. I think so. Yeah. All right, so stage two, housing markets in a more traditional recovery. And that would be number one, we're likely to see negative impact on other parts of the economy and the recovery then becomes slow. And I, I, would, I would bet that's kind of what's gonna happen. Uh, we're gonna have a, a year or two of tough and then we're gonna slowly start to climb out. That's, that's what I believe. Uh, Right, the pandemic is, is a very unique situation and the timing on its resolution is completely uncertain. So when I say all of that, I'm, I'm actually saying that, there, and we'll talk about it in a second, of the things that will happen that can mitigate this. Well, I mean, one of the things you always teach us in these is we need to be acting like the market we're moving towards, not the one we're in. And we know that the market we're in right now is kind of unprecedented, this kind of bounce back. But if we think that next year might be slower, we need to be preparing for that today. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll make one more sidebar comment about that, Jay, and that is you survive to thrive. Mm -hmm. And the, the, um, understand that um, when you go through these kind of circumstances, there is a moment when there is a true transfer of wealth that occurs, and it's, it's most likely going to happen to some degree again. And if you can put yourself in a position to survive, even if you go backwards, but you're making all the right moves financially and professionally, you can, and, and, and getting ready, you can position yourself that as this comes out, you are first in line. You are off the starting block faster than anybody else, and you will reap tremendous personal and professional reward. Mm -hmm. And history says that happens every time. Yep. Without doubt, you can, you can bet on, you can bet your life on it. We, we learned and studied that in the last shift. The companies that give up market share during these times rarely get it back, and the ones who gain it don't give it back very quickly at all. Yeah, that's so right. It is, there is an opportunity from a business standpoint to grab market share on the tail end of this for sure. That's right. Recovery in the meantime is slow, and the impacts of lower consumer spending will cause unemployment to rise in industries that are currently doing okay. Mm -hmm. And that's that domino effect that we said starting at the lowest wage earning in, uh, uh, industries and, and ultimately impacting the highest. Uh, demand for purchasing homes is going to slow when demographic groups typical of homeownership begin to have a negative impact. Again, go in this direction. Prices are likely to continue to grow because of low interest rates and low inventory. That's the, that's, and it's a little disheartening. I know, I know. We only have, I promise, one more, like, kind of bad what if before we talk about the positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we've kind of um, hung out on, on residential real estate, Jay. We, we, have, we chose not to go to commercial because it is such up in the air right now. It is very hard to predict exactly what's going to happen in the commercial real estate industry. As we began to see light on that, 
we'll report it and, and share it as fast as we get it. But it's, it's kind of a wait and see right now. They're, tr they're trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Uh, then demand will begin to recover as unemployment recovers across the economy. And uh, again, you can see that in GDP and unemployment trend numbers over history. The impetus for this will likely be a resolution of the pandemic right. for a vaccine, to be honest. So what could go wrong, right? Forbearance system gives, uh, gave a maximum forbearance period of 12 months. The system works under the assumption that within 12 months, most borrowers will have regained employment and be eligible for restructuring, right? What happens if that doesn't work? If we get to Q2, right? And the number of loans in forbearance and, and rent, by the right. way, uh, remains high, uh, we're gonna see some negative consequences. We're gonna see homes begin to moving onto the market as we close in on the deadlines and owners realize they won't be able to restructure. Well, this is um, an opportunity for us as fiduciaries to really inform our clients. Well, that, thank you for saying that, Jay. That's exactly right. If, if you know of anybody that, that has, a, has the risk of not having a job, but they own a home, there needs to be a real frank conversation around uh, live to fight another day. Mm -hmm. And that is, if you believe you might need to sell in the next 12 months, you might want to consider selling before then. Yeah, and what's you don't have to, it's entirely up to you, but, but you should just be aware that if forbearance doesn't, and, and it doesn't, doesn't end with people having more stability in employment, we're going to see houses come on the market. And it may be houses that were purchased six months before or a year before, and there may not be a lot of equity in that. If people, unlike the last recession, if people had bought their homes earlier, they're likely to have a substantial amount of equity, which does protect us and them. Yeah, that's right. So uh, loan delinquencies are, are already uh, at a significant level, you guys. And, and, and this is someone who has been in delinquency for 90 days, right? So this is um, the actual number of homes in forbearance is about 3.6 million. And that's about 7%. So it's a larger number that are in some stage of forbearance right now. Say it again. 7% of all homeowners are in forbearance right now. Right. Jay. And it's only about 3% of them that are 90 days or more. Yeah. Now, some people took advantage of forbearance, whether they actually needed it or not. Mm -hmm. They took it as almost like a, an opportunity to save some money. And, you know, I, I actually can't blame them. I, I'm, I'm, I, I think that might have actually been smart. If this is opportunity, do it. So we don't know what the real number is, Jay. We can only look at the unemployment numbers to begin a, to get a sense of what that could be. And this is where government can step in or not, right? They've had a moratorium on evictions. They haven't provided any relief for landlords, right? So there's some other things that we have to watch going forward. Yeah. So what could make a difference? So let's wrap it up on this note. So, so um, let me just say again that um, I've been through a lot of tough times in my life. This may be the toughest of them all, simply again, because all the other tough times did not involve pandemics, natural disasters all coming together to, to create a, a messy soup that is just horrific, to be honest. Um, it, it's just so tough. So what could make a difference? Well, something that makes things closer to normal before we get a vaccine. For instance, in-home rapid testing that can be done daily uh, by the way, that's, that's massive. The ability to, to be able, right, when I, when I came into the building today, and you as well and everyone here, we had our temperatures taken, right? Yes. Uh, and we had to answer some questions about where we'd been and what had been going on with us to get into the building. That's not the same thing as having a test that says whether you're positive or negative. Yeah, that's almost instantaneous, because we know one of the crazy yeah. things about this pandemic, unlike even the other ones, is that people might be spreading it for as many as two weeks yeah. before they show symptoms. Yeah, so, so knowing how to stop that becomes a massive tool. It's real simple. When you have in-home, uh, when you have rapid testing ability, and then you have widespread organized contact, contact tracing that can occur rapidly, right? And you have improved treatment protocols, which is occurring daily, They're, right? right? Um, that is, if you get sick, you have a higher confidence that the doctors can make you well. And the odds are those three things are happening in real time and will most likely occur faster than a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Just That's what we learned from the 1957, right? That even with the vaccine, there was a long drawdown, but those things can happen very fast. Yeah, it's just, 
Yes, and there's a great likelihood that we're going to see movement in those things by the end of the year, which would give you a, which would then allow you to, to peek over into 2021 and have a sense of what life is going to look like during that period. Yep. You know, I had a sense of it just driving here and, and saw people uh, with masks either on or hanging. And uh, I thought to myself, this is the new normal. And this is not uh, something that's just going to go away. Our kids right now are going to grow up wearing masks and they're going to acclimate quite quickly to it, believe it or not. Adults yep. will struggle going, oh, but, I, but, but kids will ultimately, when they get over the fact that um, they're probably not the, the group that's going to die the most from it, but they're the group that will spread it the most. And when they get over their bad self and, and respect that, um, is, this is going to be the life is, right? The, uh, getting a vaccine much sooner than expected, right? That changes expectations about the timing of the recovery and everything at that moment. But I just want to warn again that if we go back to 57, the existence of a vaccine saves lives, but the economy will still take a period of time for the vaccine to wind itself because all of a sudden these businesses have to start back up, Jay. Right. They, and, and they have to gear back up and they don't do that. They do a little of it in anticipation of increased demand. And then it's, we open up a little bit more and then people spend a little more. And then oh. we open up a little more and they spend a little more. And we open up a little more and they spend a little more. And then over time, you begin to see that as a trend and you go, okay, now I'm gonna place big bets. Uh, and, and by the way, you'll see major businesses with lots of cash, they'll start making those bets earlier. But when you can now see the trend that we really are trending towards a solution, uh, the economy is now opening back up. People are more and more getting employed. You'll see bets being made uh, across the spectrum of income. That's right. And, we've and that's got, when things open up. We have like 100 vaccines in trial right now, um, nine in the third stage. So there's an unprecedented amount of government and private capital chasing these solutions. Yeah. The faster they show up, the more momentum we'll be able to start building up quicker. It is like the faster that happens, the faster we regain momentum and the faster we get out of it. The longer it takes, the longer it takes. Jay, I started my career in 79. Um, Interest rates went to 18%. And there were two kinds of people. There were agents who went to the couch and said, I can't imagine people doing business during this period. They kind of shut down and said they would wait. Mm -hmm. And then there were other people like myself that said, nah, there are going to be people that do business and I'm going to go find them and help them uh, as best I can. And um, you have a decision to make right now as a real estate professional. Uh, the, the world needs your help. They need your advice. They need your counseling. You have to make the decision. Are you going to be there for them? And I would highly encourage you to make that decision. That's right. To be honest with you.